ons is bevoorig om vandag John de Grouchy saam met ons te hee. John is een baie bekende theoloog in Zuid-Afrika, een gerespecteerde theoloog, vele eredoktersgrade, maar het vir my een baie vreemde ding gedoen, toe hy nou uiteindelik in die einde van sy loopbaan kom, om na een retreat centrum toe te gaan. Ek sou eerder verwacht het, dat jy nog een paar studente begeleid, en nog een paar boeken skryf en optree, omdat jy baie gesog is internationaal. Wat het jou en jou vrou laat besluit, John, om te gaan vestig op een retreat centrum? Uh, thank you, Johan, for the question. Um, Yes, I had been uh, I'd been a pastor for 10 years uh, before I became uh, an academic at the University of Cape Town, uh, and I was there for 30 years. Uh, and then the question was for my wife Isabel and myself, what do we do next? Mm. Um, it, it was difficult to think that retirement meant the end. Maybe retirement meant the beginning of something, and we went with our congregation that we belong to in Cape Town in Rondebosch on retreat to a place called Falmut, which is a retreat center that's been going since 1986. And uh, that evening, um, as we were sharing together, uh, things began to happen uh, in my life. And as I walked out of the door, uh, I I swear to you, I heard a voice saying, you'll come and live here. Now, I'm not given to that kind of thing. I don't hear voices normally. I don't even hear the voice of my wife. <laughs> so, uh, that was very unusual. And I know how the brain works. I, I think it was a combination of things that a new, a new door was opening. Uh, and that all that I'd been doing in terms of academic work and theological reflection and writing needed now to be released into a new dimension within the context of a community committed to daily prayer together, spiritual growth, healing, reconciliation, uh, and a, a community really in which uh, Isabel and I could become part uh, in a new phase in our lives. Ja. John, dit, as die mens na jou vroere werke kyk, dan krijg je indruk dat jy baie reformed was. Maar toe het daar een beduidende skyf plaas gevind, en toe skryf jy goed soos Into the Mystery, en, ja. um, en jy skryf een boek oor die kone, wat eindelijk heel te mal vreemd is vir die traditie waar het jy gekom het. Wat het hierdie groot skyf in jou meegebring? Ja, ek bly gereformeerd, jy weet. Okay. Maar een alternatief gereformeerd. Okay. I, I think, um, uh, one of the great sayings of John Calvin, who is not always loved by people, was when he was asked, well now, what happens uh, in the communion service? Because he was in an argument with the Catholics and with the Lutherans and all of this. And he just said, I don't know, I just adore the mystery. Mm -hmm. There are things that are far greater than we can begin to comprehend, mm -hmm. uh, begin to understand. And the moment we think that we know who God is, is the moment that we have created an idol. We think we now have God, we've got God in a box. But really we've just got a a, a rather large grandfather, or we've got a policeman, or something like that, an image that, uh, that we have of God. Mm. Our images, I have learned over the years, have continually to be broken. The images we have of God, if we are ever going to journey into the mystery of who God actually is, mm. and it's always a journey beyond where we think we have grasped who mm. God is. Mm. Not a journey uh, outside of God, but a journey that God is actually leading us into, uh, into a deeper understanding. And there come moments in life where that begins to happen in new ways. Yeah. So hierdie reis hou nooit op nie. Dit hou aan tot die einde van jou leven. Die reis gaan aan. Maar daar het een baie tragische gebeurtenis in jou leven geleid 
tot een groot verandering in jou leven. En het, dit klink betekent dat je praat over jou leven alsof dit een groot nieuwe fase van jou leven ingebring het. Een groot verandering in je verhouding met God en, en, en hoe je bid en alles meer gebring het. Kun je ons meer daarvan vertellen, alsjeblieft? Yes, um, I, I committed my life to Christ as a young teenager. I was 15 years old. And uh, already in my 20s, I was a pastor of a church. And I had already studied six years theology. I thought I knew most things about God. Um, but of course, that's only the beginning of a journey of unlearning everything that you have learned in order to begin to learn what really is important. Um, Steve, my elder son, um, was also a theologian. He taught at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He had also been uh, the, the head missionary at uh, Kuruman in the Moffat Mission for 10 years. And he and I were very close together. He had been a student of mine. Uh, you must remember I was a father at 22 and Steve was my son. I have another son who's here today, also very close to me. Uh, but Steve and I shared a great deal together. And then came that dreaded Sunday afternoon. Uh, when you have a telephone call. I'm sure there are people here who have had this telephone call. Uh, it was from Steve's wife in uh, Peter Maritzburg. Uh, Steve, we cannot find Steve. He went rafting on the Moya River with David, his son, and he didn't appear again. And we have looked everywhere. We've brought in the emergency services, even into the bush there. We're looking everywhere, but we cannot find him. Uh, that is a, a moment I don't wish to ever have again, and I hope mm -hmm. nobody else does, but we do have that moment. My wife and I managed to get on the next plane that we could from, we live in Amanus from Cape Town to Johannesburg, drove up to Peter Maritzburg. And the next morning I went by car with a very close friend of Steve's, my own uh, friend, uh, whose daughter I think is here now, but maybe will be at 10 o'clock, I don't know. I, if she's here now, I want to say hello. Mm. Um, and we went to this farm where the Moy River f flew through the farm went down through the bush, it was very rugged. I had gone there uh, without proper shoes. I had to put Steve's shoes on. They were lying in the cabin. I walked in his shoes. They were always too big for me. He, had, he was too big for his boots and I was not big enough for his boots. Walked down to the river and the person who was our guide said, this is where we think Steve is trapped beneath the rocks. Uh, this is seven years ago. Well, it will be seven years ago in February, 21st of February. It happened 2010. And I remember sitting on the rocks and my friend Carissa, who may be his mother, was sitting on the rocks not far away because she had traveled with me. And I cannot recall anything of the next hour and a half, except according to her, some terrible, I made some terrible cries. She didn't think I was capable of making that noise, mm -hmm. but it was, it was painful. It was, it was just life shattering. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what was also happening was that all the things that I had believed trusted in, images of God, were all being broken, being uh, just shattered and thrown into the river. Um, and it was as I was walking back an hour and a half later to the cottage up on the hill, and I was evidently continued crying out that I became overwhelmed with the sense that I was starting a new journey, uh, which I later began to describe as a journey into mystery, and I wrote a book with that title, 
in which I explored the beginning of this journey, this new journey, age 70, I was 70 years old at the time, uh, and uh, I was starting a new journey. Uh, and I had no concept at all to guide me, except that it was a journey into the unknown, uh, but a journey into mystery. And one of my favorite definitions of theology is it's a journey into mystery. I knew that, but I'd never experienced that. Mm. And so, age 70, a new journey began into mystery. John, so you say that the beginning was on for all work in your life, the mere the dimension of still gebed work to make, the meditative, contemplative world. Mm. And can you tell us something about what it for you is and what it on your doing? Yeah, I wasn't very silent or contemplative that day. Mm. That was that was a cry. But you know, a very important moment in my journey was in 1964 when I visited Thézé community in France. And some of you will have been there and know about it, and of course you've been there. I didn't know why I was going to Thézé. Thézé incidentally started as a Gerefemirda community, but it was a, a monastery, quite unusual, very unusual. Mm. Um, and I remember arriving there as a young man I'd come from America where I was studying, and I went up to the, to the monastery, knocked on the door. Uh, a brother came to the door, and uh, he said, yes, and I said that, uh, who I was, and he said, yes, we were expecting you a day late. Why are you a day late? But at any rate, welcome. He put me down next to a tree in the garden, and he said, why have you come? Well, to be quite honest, I didn't know. Um, I was a kind of a tourist, yeah? church tourist. Mm. Yeah? So I said, I don't really know. He says, well, I'll tell you why you've come. You will spend the week in silence. Those words were the most terrible words I'd ever heard till that point in my life, <laughs> a week in silence. Uh, and I will give you some things to read and think about. Then on Friday, I want to meet with you uh, and I want to talk about your life. Well, I did that for a week. I went to worship each day in the chapel. At that time, I was the only guest. Can you imagine at Teze when you see all the thousands of people there now? I was the only guest that week there, 64. And I, s I sat in a cell the whole week, walked in the fields, looked at the trees, but I didn't talk. I went to worship three times a day. I read, I thought about my life, and then I met with him. And that was a gentle but fairly terrifying experience. And that night I ate with the brothers. And suddenly I experienced the hospitality of God in this community. Uh, from that time on, I knew that that was a very fundamental thing in my journey. It is also the place where my son Steve felt called to the ministry when he had gone there as a young student as well. So, but that was many years later. Uh, so that has been part of, not a very prominent part in the sense that I have done a lot of retreats and I'm not a retreat leader really, but that's entering into stillness and into contemplation becomes more and more important in my life and never so more than now, living in Falmouth, and connecting contemplation with action because the true contemplative is also the person who puts faith and hope into action in the life of the world. It's not a withdrawal from the world, it's another way of being in the world. Mm. John, net in a paar sinne, for ons iets verduidelik van wat contemplatie is in ons traditie, um, het ons nie groot geword met die woord nie. En ons weet nie mooi wat het beteken om te mediteer en te contempleer nie. Ek ook nie, jy weet. Okay. <laughs> Dis ook iets, ek, iets net, net ietsie wat jy geleer het tot ja, nou weet, toe. Wat, wat het ek geleer. Ja. En ek, ek leer nog, jy weet. Ja. Um, well, meditation is when you uh, uh, are reading the scriptures not because you're wanting to prepare a talk or a sermon or whatever it may be, that's something else. 
although that can arise out of, and it does for me always, meditation is, is chewing, as Denise said yesterday, yeah, chewing on the words. It's entering into the story, like the story we read today of Nicodemus and Jesus, a conversation, and putting yourself in that conversation. Uh, it's like becoming part of that conversation uh, and listening to it uh, with new ears, but also beginning to hear what Jesus is saying to you and how you identify also with Nicodemus. Uh, and using the scriptures in that way is meditatio, as the monks would say. Contemplation is another development it often starts with meditation. Mm. And in fact, it's a good thing to start with meditation because otherwise you start to daydream when you start contemplating. Mm. Contemplation is entering into stillness, quietness, uh, laying your life open, uh, and trying to listen. Listening with the heart, uh, listening in a new way and you are listening in order to see, to see differently, to see the world differently, uh, to see yourself differently, to see your relationships differently. But you're not praying, you're not speaking, you are just being still, listening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, John, you believe in conversations, and thank you very much for having this conversation with us today. What image or picture comes to your mind when you hear conversation and think about conversations? I love conversations. Mm. <laughs> There's nothing more than I like going to a coffee shop with somebody uh, and talking together and sharing. Uh, it's, it's like communion. You know, communion doesn't just happen in church some Sundays with bread and wine. It also ha happens in coffee shops. Mm. And Jesus was always having conversations. The woman at the well. You, you go through the gospel stories. If there had been coffee shops in Galilee, he would have known exactly where they were. Um, it's in that conversation that you discover who you are and who the other person is, and together you discover something happening that is deeper than just the two of you. Uh, it's, it's a mystery. Uh, don't try and explain it. It's what is happening there is an interaction. And when those conversations really get deep, something very important is happening. Once a week on a Saturday morning, I go to the book cottage in Hermanus where my friend John is the manager. He's a wonderful guy. He used to be a very ardent Christian. He gave up on that lot long ago. Uh, I love him. And he makes great coffee. And he loves books. He also has a doctorate in history and music. Great musician. We sit for two hours every Saturday morning talking like this. And the, the, the themes just emerge. And you know, after a whole many, he told me, 25 years, he came to a service that I was involved in at Falmouth not recently, a communion service. And for the first time in 25 years, having been a very ardent fundamentalist Christian in his young youth, for the first time in 25 years, he took the cup and the bread and he said, my eyes were opened. That began in the coffee shop that conversation, mm -hmm. which led us into a deeper relationship. So I'm a great believer that Jesus works through conversation. John, you have a very good New Testament scholar. You're a very good New Testament yeah. scholar. Yeah, yeah. And um, t tell us about Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Wonderful story. You know, when yes. I first heard that story, it was from a born-again Christian who was trying to get me to be born again. And I was an easy target. 15-year-old, gee, 
That's an easy target. <laughs> Fifteen year olds get born again every day of the year, <laughs> like some of you. Mm. So, um, and it's a wonderful story, but I totally misunderstood the story. Mm. Not totally, but I have grown to love that story because I've grown to understand it better. Mm. I thought it was all about how to get to heaven. Mm. It's not. It's nothing to do with how to get to heaven. It's how to become open to heaven coming to you. Mm. The kingdom of heaven. Yeah. That is the presence of God. Mm. It's how to become, how to enter into the presence of God in this life, whatever might happen later. Nicodemus had tried all his life as a Pharisee to keep the law, to do everything correctly, and he still felt he hadn't entered into the presence of God in a very real and meaningful way. Mm. Jesus says, you won't, Nicodemus, uh, uh, unless you are born all over again. Now, come on, Jesus. <laughs> I'm 70 years old. Mm. We, you know, there's no way I can become a child again. I heard you say the other day, unless you become like a little child, you'll never see, see the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I heard you say the other day that the kingdom of God is, is, is here. Kingdom of God is within you. Kingdom of God is coming. All sorts of ways you describe the kingdom. But I've never seen that. I've never seen that. Jesus says, because you haven't got the eyes that are open to see it. And that's why you cannot see that actually what I am doing, I am actually embodying that kingdom. Uh, so you've actually got to start again, Nicodemus. Uh, you've got to enter into the mystery with new eyes. Even at 70, you can do that. I know that. I, I can tell you that. At 70... You can become like a child again. Mm -hmm. And you can see things totally differently to the way you saw them before. So that story is very real to me because the Christian life is being born again and again and again and again and again, even today. Amen. Thank you very much, John. Can you see John by donkey say? Thank you. Gemeente, ek weet nie waar jy vermoorde is in jou leven nie en wat in hierdie gesprek, in hierdie story na jou toe gekom het nie. Misschien is jy op baie donkere plek en uh, dit is baie zwaar vir jou en dit hou groot moendlikhede in dat die koninkryk van God na jou toe kan kom en dat jy God kan ervaar. Waar jy ook al is vandag, ons sal graag saam met jou wil bid, saam met jou wil wees, in hierdie tyd waar jy is, as jy enigszins belang stel, dat om te gesels, of dat iemand saam met jou bid, is jy welkom om nou na afloop van hierdie dienst, na die klipkerk toe te gaan. Baie dankie aan amal wat ook so hard gewerk het, in die afloop tyd wat voorbij is, dit het baie goed gegaan met ons expo, en ons is dankbaar, en kyk uit na groot jaar wat voorle ook vir ons as gevolg van dit wat ons kon recht kry in die afgelopen tyd. Die genade van die Heere Jesus, die liefde van God en die gemeenskap van die Heilige Gees. Wees en bly met elkeen van julle in die week wat voorle. Amen.